Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 209, The Rhythm of Play, Exploring Board Game Pacing. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. Tonight, we've got some questions from one of our Patreon patrons about board game pacing. After that, we've got two reviews for you, including another Disney Sorcerer's Arena expansion, Leading the Charge, and some actual new hotness. Dr. Lovenstein presents No Context, a party game due to be released to the public at the end of the month, the day after this episode goes live. And then we wrap up with a longer than usual week in review, which includes some games played at our barbershop bar event, a game night with my kids, and more. Remember, you can always find links to the games and other things we mentioned on the show through our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 209. I gotta say, it's great that we've been calling that out because we've seen the hits on the blog and lots of people are checking out the notes. So we appreciate that. We appreciate anyone that uses our links. Now let's get on to a trip to the Suggestion Box. Welcome to this week's Suggestion Box. Here we share a small selection of feedback we've gotten on our content. First up, a couple of comments on our Must Have Expansions episode, which we wanted to share together for reasons that will soon be obvious. First, Ron Frazier writes, You guys may have never played, but Unfinished Business is a must-have expansion for Star Wars Outer Rim won't play Outer Rim without the ambitions, new contacts, and extra items and missions. It takes a good game and elevates it to great. Mm. And then, Solo Board Game Night, that's Night with a K, writes, In my opinion, Unfinished Business is hands down the best expansion I have ever played. The cards added and added game mechanics from AI to additional goals has elevated Outer Rim to a whole new level. Phenomenal expansion. Too Many Bones, as well as Marvel Champions, has done a great job with expansions. Even G.I. Joe deck building game has been releasing pretty great expansions, with the Transformers crossover being a standout. Well, thanks both of you for the great comments. Uh, I've got to try Outer Rim. Uh, Contrary to what some people may think, uh, being a big Star Wars fan, I don't actually rush out and buy every Star Wars game that comes out. After playing a number of them, um, mostly all coming from the same company that I found to be disappointing overall. Due to this, I held off on Outer Rim, and I was glad I did because the initial reviews that came out basically said the game was great for one play, but then after that it gets repetitive and you go through the entire deck the first play, and man, does this need an expansion. Now, it took a while for the expansion to come out, and by then I just, you know, wasn't following along anymore and didn't really care. But now that I've got at least two people, and these aren't the only comments we got on this, if I remember someone in the chat room also called it out during that show, I really do think I do have to give Outer Rim a try, but only with that expansion. I never said you bought them all right away. I just said that you buy them all eventually. As we see here, it can take some time. There you go. True, true. So the the other the other games that got mentioned there, right? So there was also Marvel Champions. That I'm still exploring the core set. I am looking forward to checking out uh, characters for that one, but I still haven't actually tried the core set. Um, unfortunately, my original copy got lost, was damaged, and I had to replace it. And all I've done is unbox the new copy. We haven't sat down to play. And that's something Sean needs to try that one. But the uh, the intro adventure is only two players, so we just haven't sat down to do it. I know it plays three later. Um, the other one that was mentioned there is Too Many Bones um, by, by um, <clears throat> what is the name of the company? Chip Theory Games. Sorry, I was drawing a blank there. That is a game I always wanted to try but never have. And this is one of those games that has so much stuff, ridiculous stuff, and big deluxe boxes and tons of dice. And even just going to their booth at any game con, I've seen them at a couple different ones now. It's just overwhelming, and I have no idea where you would even start. Is the base game still too many bones? I don't even know. Now, as for the Renegade Games games, which sounds kind of silly, sorry, I I do think it's kind of cool that they're doing the crossover there. It's kind of neat. So I haven't seen anything with My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria yet, which is the one we did review. But I'm getting flashbacks here to back when I collected Marvel Comics, and these kind of crossovers happen pretty regularly. Like, I'm never going to forget when Spider-Man met the Transformers. Fair enough. Well, sticking with the topic of Renegade Deck Builders, here's a couple of comments on our recent My Little Pony Adventures in Equestria review. Daniel Anderson writes, I really like this game. It's a solid deck builder and can be quite challenging in solo play. 
-hmm. where I posted my playthrough video, my parents reminded me that I was very much into MLP as a kid. <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. And Tabletop Gazette writes, this is a great game, and the new expansion adds festival cards, which adds just the right amount of tension to it as well. Nice. Something to make it a little more difficult, I think, could be useful. Um, in our recent plays, when we used all the, I forget what they're called, situation cards, I think are the bad blue cards you put in the deck. I had to read my own review to double check what they're called. I don't know, the, the blue bad cards. Uh, even with all of them, we, we have won every game we played, so I think a little more tension would be nice. So thank you both for the comments, and I got to say it's awesome to see other people digging this game. Just today I was on YouTube grabbing some links for our newsletter, and I was like, man, not enough people have seen that review. And I think everyone's skipping it because it's it's My Little Pony, and gamers are like, yeah, it's a My Little Pony kids game. Don't overlook this one due to the theme, seriously. Like, no one's watching that review. I wish they would just so they realize that they shouldn't be skipping it, but how do you convince someone to watch a review for a game they're not interested to make them interested in the game? It's kind of a catch-22 there. Yeah. Now, as for expansions, I am extremely curious to see what they add to the game, and I will say um, I sent some emails to Renegade, so we'll see where that goes. All right, well, finally, we've got a feel-good comment to put us in the right mood for the rest of the show. I could use that today. B5 Productions, the team behind Color Court, posted this on Facebook this week, along with one of our pictures of their game. Tabletop Bellhop has put out a lot of great content about Court in all formats, written, audio, and video. They share all of the pros and cons of the game and really do a good job helping you see if the game is for you. They always do great coverage of games, so if you don't follow them already, I suggest you do. Thank you to them for taking the time to check out Court. I, I loved reading this. This, uh, to me, nails what I think sets us apart from every other reviewer out there. I'm not saying no one else does this, or, but in general, from, from the massive reviewers out there, and I'm not saying we're better, we just do things different. It's the fact we produce our content in three formats, and we focus on making sure people can figure out if the game is right for them. Yes, we share our thoughts, whether we liked it or not, but we like to focus on what we liked, what we didn't like, and why, so you can make your own decision. And it's great. I, I love it when I see people that see that. I'm like, great, you appreciate us for what I want you to appreciate us for. So thank you for that, B5 Productions. Absolutely. There's plenty of games out there that are maybe fine games that just don't click with us for some reason. Now, that's all the feedback we have to share tonight. Thanks to everyone who interacts with our content, even if we don't highlight every interaction here on the show. Before we get on with the show, we do have an unintentional oopsie to apologize for. It seems we released our Castellans of Valeria preview a little quicker than expected. Yeah, our apologi apologies to Daily Magic Games for letting the cat out of the bag a little earlier than they intended. Uh, while it was very clear they wanted our content before June 6th, it wasn't clear that they didn't want it released until June 6th. Now, I've been back and forth with my contact there, and everything's copacetic. They understand what happened. There's no bleem being tossed around. Uh, they like the term that they want to release a flood of reviews at once, and when you were going to release a flood, you expect a little leak. All right. Well, they haven't asked us to take down the content that's up, so there's no worry there. But we still wanted to issue a public apology and let you all in on the fact that you can get a sneak peek of Castellans of Valeria a little early. Yeah, this, this might be a pleasant surprise. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. So tonight's question comes from Roger Malosh, Patreon patron, local Windsor gamer, and longtime fan of the show, as well as indie game designer that you can find at rogerdodgergames.com. That's R-O-G-E-R-D-O-G-E-R, -E -E games.com. Roger writes, hey, Mo and Sean, I enjoy your show and look forward to my weekly dose of game talk. I have a question about game pace. A little while ago, I was playing a complex five-player game which seemed to drag on forever. I would plan my latest move, and wait, and wait, and wait. By the time my turn finally came around, I had forgotten my original plan. <laughs> I would quickly come up with something, then execute my turn because I didn't want to slow the game down even more. Unfortunately, this was usually far from an optimal play, and I ended up trailing behind everybody. On the flip side, I tend to do poorly in real-time games because I need a little time to plan my moves, and this just doesn't happen in real-time games. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit like Goldilocks when it comes to game pace. Not too fast, not too slow, but just the right pace for me to make those optimal plays. What kind of game pace do you generally prefer? 
Also, can you discuss a few examples of very fast or very slow paced games? Well, thanks, Roger, for tonight's topic and even better for being in the chat room to hear us discuss this. Uh, I would love to hear when we get to preferred pacing, uh, your thoughts and what games you prefer. And I'll ta call that out on the show as well. Now, I do feel a little bad um, as I know exactly what game he's talking about with that complex five player game. Uh, which I know he played at one of our barbershop bar events and went on a little longer than expected. Now, Roger has some specific questions, which we will get to. But first, I want to talk a bit about board game pacing in general, and more importantly, give you some ideas on what you can do as players to affect that pacing, hopefully to make the more game more enjoyable for everyone at the table. Now, we've hit on many of these ideas and tips, mentioning them in other shows, but never actually addressed the topic directly. So that's what we're hoping to do tonight. Now, one interesting thing that hit me when working on this topic, and it was one of those I've written paragraphs of text and done research and written all this stuff. And then I had come up with the episode title and I had just put long games and short games. And then I realized this isn't about game length at all. Game length and pacing are two completely different things. You can play a very long game, even an 18 hour game that moves along at a nice pace. And you can play a short 15 minute game that still manages to drag on turn after turn. Now, unfortunately, there's no easy way to know which sort of way the pacing will go without experience. Yeah. Though usually you can bet that your first playthrough is going to be at a slower pace. Yeah, when you're learning the game, that is going to be a slower paced game just by default. So my first thing I want to talk about in regards to board game pacing is the thing we talk about a lot in our show, and that is setting expectations before the game starts. Now, we say this a lot on our show. This is probably the number one piece of advice we give every gamer. And it's it, honestly, it's the number one fix. So for so many game night problems before starting to play a game, you should make sure everyone about to play is on the same pace. And this is in regards to both the pace and the game length. If this is a super long game, they should know. If there's lots of downtime and thinking, the player should know. If there is a large turnaround between player turns, let people know. If you let people know, you know what? This is one of those games where everyone's going to be planning a lot. And it's perfectly fine if you get up from the table and, you know, go grab a drink or go to the washroom between your turns because it's one of those games. Or the opposite. You know what? This is a game that requires a lot of focus. We're on a time limit and I need everyone to pay attention. I need you to take your turns quickly. This is going to be a real time game. And, you know, if your phone, put your phones on, on silent for a minute or, you know, if you need the washroom, go use it now before we start. Yeah. And along with that, uh, you should have expectations about um, sort of what uh, what how it how it normally plays versus, you know, if this is your first time, mm -hmm. how it's going. Uh, again, expectations, setting expectations. And if it's the first time for everybody, that should be clear as well, because maybe yes. everyone doesn't know. And you know, at that point, you have to be ready to say, well, we've got three hours. I think we can get this in, but it is a first game teach. Is everyone going to be OK if we don't finish mm -hmm. or staying later if we do want to try and finish? Yeah, and remember also, to, just to kind of hint back to the other thing is this should be part of a bigger conversation, right? as Sean said, is a learning game, but you should also be discussing how competitive it is. Hey, this is a learning game. No one take this too seriously. Play around to find out what's going on. Or you know what? We all know the rules. We've all played before. I want to see who's going to win this. Let's take this seriously. Heck, let's put some money on the table. Those are two very different styles to sit down and play that are both going to affect your pacing. So that should be part of the overall conversation, as well as bringing up any potential problematic content in the game and other things we've talked about on past shows. Now, one example I want to bring up that's specifically related to board game pacing that is meant to be discussed before the game is a game I don't actually own, but I have played, and that is Five Tribes. This is a game where you put out a, a grid of tiles and you put a bunch of meeple on them and you play Moncala. You pick up all the pe meeple from one square and then drop them one at a time in other spots and then score. The problem with the game is there's so many meeple out there and so many squares and possible combinations that no one could figure out all the math for every possible play. But there are players out there that will try and try their hardest. The rule book even says you may need to limit the times on some players. Don't think about it too much. One or two points isn't going to win or lose you the game. Just find a move that looks good and do it. 
when the rule book has to warn you, you know there's a potential pacing issue in that game. Yeah, that's 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 tough. And, and but it's important, and that's why it's in the rule book, is because it's a discussion that needs to be had. Yeah. Similarly, with other discussions, as we're talking about this, you know, big picture discussion in advance, if like Roger, you like to take a little time to find that better move, let people know. Yeah. You know, if if you if you kind of just go with the flow, I I personally tend to sort of, you know, whatever the game's is I'm probably just gonna go along and you know if people are taking a little longer I might I might be willing to take a little longer but if things are rushing I'll just pick a move I'm not yeah. that competitive so I'm I'm pretty easy going when it comes to timing but if you aren't and you know that you aren't make a note of it let people let people be yep. aware and help that let them that help them make decisions about the game going forward. Yep. Now the other thing you do have to watch when you're talking about pacing the game is are you in some form of time limit. Is it just an open game night at your house that starts at six and you play till whenever? You probably don't have to worry about it. But are you going to try to get in a game of Catan in one hour? You want to do it on your lunch break? That can work. I can easily finish a game of Catan in an hour as long as everyone else is on the page trying to play quickly and make quick moves and focus. If everyone knows how to do it, you can get done in no time. Now, are you if you're at a public play event or even your home game night, do you want to play one game all night? That's it. You're going to sit down. You're going to focus. You're going to take your time. You're going to really deep dive this game or do you want to try to fit in three, four games so you have more of an experience? All of that should be talked about before picking which game to play and then pick games that fit that. Yeah, absolutely. Timing is so important because it's really easy to just sit down and, oh, we're going to play a game tonight. And I'm, you know, let's take the evil example of Monopoly. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, six hours later, people are still bouncing back and forth the last few thousand dollars and it never apparently is going to end yes. um if, if you'd had that discussion up front uh perhaps even discussed which or which uh which host rules you are or mm -hmm. aren't going to use you might have headed that all off at the pass and had a solid game night or known that you were going to play until four o'clock in the morning when somebody yep. finally threw down their money and left so I think what we'll do next is let's talk a bit about the main factors that affect game length. Basically, what makes a game long game long and a short game short, um, which is also going to affect pacing in that case, because the, the things affect the overall length because of the different pace they give. And one of the biggest impacts that I've now witnessed um, over many, many game plays on pacing is how many players are playing. That seems to be the biggest factor for both how quick the game plays and how fast it plays at the table time between turns and all of that. The more people, the longer it's going to take. It just it's a given you unless the game does something to limit it, which I props to Valeria Card Kingdoms for recognizing this as a problem in their core game where when you play with five players, the fifth player doesn't do a thing. And I honestly, I stopped my head. I forget what it is. But when you have five players, the fifth player skips a thing and then that rotates so that you don't have a full player turn as the fifth player every time it goes around the table. Now, like next time you're not the fifth player. So it's everyone still gets an equal number of turns. But they realized waiting for someone to buy and go and, and, and fight bad guys and capture keeps just takes too long. And they didn't want the count that high. So I think player count is one of the biggest ones. And if you are interested in a more long drawn out experience, play games with more people. And if you want a quick game, play games with less people. And along with that, you get into the interaction of players. So mm -hmm. games with high player interaction are often going to take longer, the more players you add, as opposed to certain uh, multiplayer solitaire games where the acts of another person aren't going to affect your turn. Mm -hmm. So you have the ability to pre-plan and know that, little if anything is going to get completely destroyed by the actions of other players yes uh, so that that interaction level within the player count uh sort of scales how the player to count uh the player count makes things worse or better and then the next thing is how much stuff do you have to do on your turn the, the turn time and i'm not talking about ap we'll get to that ap is definitely it sean's already mentioned it a bit but but just the amount of stuff you have to do like the amount of things you have to choose from, the amount of actions you take. Do you take three actions out of a list of eight? Do you have to roll the dice, then move a piece, then take an action, then draw a card, then react to that card, then do something else? Or do you just roll a bunch of meeple as quick as possible and stop when you're done? 
Like those are all different pacing that is going to be different based on the turn time. And again, some games have all of those pacings at the same, or all of them ability to do all of those things. If you look at a game like um, uh, Tapestry, sometimes a game, sometimes a turn can be really quick. Sometimes yep. you're making a move on the map and you're taking this and, and, you know, all of a sudden your turn is three times longer than your last turn yes. simply because of the action track you decided to move on that turn. Yeah, engine builders are, I don't know if you call it good or bad for that because they tend to start off with a slow pace because you don't have a lot of options. You don't have a lot of things to do. Whereas later in the game, you're setting off all these chain reactions and it takes forever to finish your turn. Now, of course, there's also the round time. Which, yeah, is the total turn time. But the problem is there's upkeep usually. There's usually more that happens either at, like at the start or end of a turn, some kind of upkeep that happens, or the start or end of a round. Games that I find are bad for this, that I don't enjoy, are games where you have to reseed a board, where you have to clear stuff and put new stuff up. A great example of this is Castles of Burgundy. I love playing that game on Board Game Arena, and I almost hate playing it in person, having to pull out all the tiles. And then, of course, there's a whole problem where the tiles don't tell you what they do, and I don't have a tooltip like I do online, but that's that's unrelated. I just hate the time wasted clearing the board, pulling out new little chits and putting them onto the proper spots, and then possibly forgetting that one of the spots is only changes every other round. Just, it's fiddly. Whereas, uh, on the opposite side, a game that actually has a really quick and efficient end game is this new game that we uh, released a little early, Castlands of Valeria. Uh, yeah. There's a scoring round at the end of every single round, and the first time you do it, it's a little tricky. But yep. uh, as you've done it, my third time, when we just played on the weekend, and it was really fast. There were two of us doing it. Uh, you know, one person who was marking the score, and I would sit there, point at the section we were looking at, going, all right, you won first, you get this many points. You won second, you get this many points. We tied for third, split the points. And yep. move through, and really, really quick and efficient, as opposed to trying to reset things. And then Sean mentioned the thinking time of what the other players did. And I kind of broaden this out to just in general, how much does the board state change between turns and rounds? Now, yeah, in most cases, this is going to be the actions of the other players, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's something where you draw a random event or things on the board move or, or um, I, I'm like, you think of like potion explosion. It's what the other players do because they're taking a marble, but like they're not planning. They're not, they're not strategically doing something that messes with your turn but the state of the board or what you're interacting with changes. And this is one of the biggest factors for pacing, not necessarily game length, but pacing. Can you plan out your move or will things change too much in between before you actually get to ask? Now, I know this was an issue on one of the, one of the issues why Rogers Gaming was talking about takes so long is that is a game where in general, you can kind of plan ahead. But if someone takes your action or takes your thing or does the thing you want to do, you basically have to redo everything, and that could be the player just before you. Yeah, absolutely. This is something you, you really have to watch for or be aware of, not necessarily watch for. It's a perfectly acceptable part of yes. a game, but you need to know whether that's going to happen. Uh, another option is in deck builders. Sometimes, you know, the, when, when the villain goes, and you know, in a co-op deck builder, when the villain goes at the beginning of every turn or at the end of every turn, they could have a sort of their own triggering effects that could take mm -hmm. longer all of a sudden, you know, you're a little later in the game and the villain's got more things they can do. So it's not just pull yeah. one card and, and do it. It's pull one card, but that triggers another card, which triggers another card, which triggers another mm -hmm. card. And so those those turns can get a little bit longer as that game goes on and, and you run closer to the, the lose condition. And then similar to this, though, I, I have it separated out because to me, the, it doesn't necessarily mean the board state changes, but just random elements. Anytime there's something there you can't plan for, it's going to require more tactical thinking. You're going to have to react instead of plan ahead. Every, an event that comes up every round, any game that uses dice, is there like a neutral player character that's going to do something between the player's turns, which kind of, again, kind of goes with that cooperative deck builder thing. Um, even non-deck builders, like you mentioned that when I was thinking Sentinels of the Multiverse, where after every action, you know, there's there's the uh, the event happens and then... The, the villain goes and then all their henchmen go and all of that stuff going on before I, a deck of cards is used like, oh, if the Joker came up, that means something happens different from anything else that you may not have expected. Or just as simple as you roll the dice every turn. 
you know, you, you can't plan for what those dice are, how those dice are going to come up and you need to deal with it. And then I, and the other one, of course, is thinking time, which I think kind of comes from all of the above, right? It's everything we've already talked about is going to impact the player's thinking time. But this is also a factor of how quick do the players think. Some people are fast on their feet and quick to see things. Some people are better at spatial reasoning. Other people are better at st strategy and planning ahead. There is a huge factor in the, the ability is the wrong word, but the, the skills of the players playing the game is going to impact your pacing greatly. Uh, there are certain gamers out there that I don't enjoy playing with because of the pace they like to play games. That does not match mine. Meanwhile, there's other people I'd love to play with because, man, they're like on the ball and they're like, boom, 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 boom. And they're still winning. And I'm like, it blows me away. It's awesome. And at the same time, the, the game you're playing can impact this. Now, some people yes. are going to take a long time no matter what. And that's those people. And if they know that, they should be mentioning that up front. But sometimes because the game encourages longer uh, play times and, and you can come up with things in advance, the, the board state isn't changing dramatically you've got other people's turns to make your decisions on. Unlike some games where it's, you know, it's a whole new board state when you get there and <laughs> good luck. If they're, a, if they're a heavy thinker, they're gonna, they only have their turn to, to think. Yeah. So it's gonna stretch on. Now this is, a, this is one that isn't about specific game, but another thing that's gonna impact your game time, which isn't, is your pace of your game night more than the pace of the game, is your setup and takedown time. This has a big impact, especially if you're on a time limit. When you've got that one hour Catan game, don't forget, you've got to set up Catan. You've got to, depending on how well put away your game is, you might have to split up all the decks. You might have to divvy out all the player colors. You probably want to randomly generate the board, though I got to say, if you're on the one hour time limit, using the set board in the middle of the book is probably your best way to go for Catan. But that's just a little side tip on playing a quick game of Catan. But you're going to have to put the little chits out on everything and you're going to have to place the robber on the desert. And then someone at the end of the game has got to put it away. And if you're literally on a time limit, like you've got to be back at your workstation, you, someone has to account for that time. Yeah. And this this goes to a lot of other shows we've talked about how to set up, a, uh, you know, how to pre, how to pack up your game, how to efficiently store things. There's a whole lot of different uh, episodes we've had talking about things that can impact this uh this time limit on setting up and yeah. tearing down so we're not going to go into all of that but just be aware that it does play uh play a part and another th aspect is if you are having players set up their own pieces mm -hmm. it can actually help them understand the game better and might help them make uh decisions faster yeah. if you know your game board setup because you've put all the pieces down on it sometimes for some players that can really assist in game play speed now another thing i want to mention too is game length can affect your pacing because if your game is long enough you're going to want to take breaks and it depending on the content of your game you may want to take breaks if games are intense uh, ex odd example of this at the barbershop bar on the weekend there was a group i taught go cuckoo who needed a break after the game because they were just so into it and so intense and they were like literally sweating playing this game because they had never played anything that was that tense and like, oh my God, it's going to drop. That they're like, no, no, we, we need a 15 minute breather here. We're all going to get a drink. And yeah, you can come back and show us something else in a bit, but we need to like chill. And, and uh, another example, like you're playing a game of Twilight Imperium, allow time for bathroom breaks. Maybe you want to have a dinner break in there somewhere. Or someone's going to go run and go grab Tim's. That is also going to affect the pace of the game. Now, not every round that's going to come up, but you might want to set it that, you know, once we're two hours in, we're going to take a 15 minute break. All right. Well, we know some of the things that are built into a game that can impact that uh, speed and pacing. But what can you do as a player? Now, the ones I came up with were basically for games that were going long, but some of these will also apply to quick games as well. But in general, it's hard to affect a quick, short game. There's not a lot you can do. It's a quick, short game. But it's longer games you could do more. And of course, the most important, and we always encourage everyone to do this. I can't believe there was actually a thread on Twitter the other day where someone refuses to do that and thinks it's, it's terrible, which I was just like, man, you shouldn't be playing hobby games, is plan your move on other players' turns. Now, I know it's not always possible. And as Roger mentioned, it can be hard if downtime's too long and you can forget your plan. Um, I know I've had that problem many, many times where... 
I, I back when we were playing Catan more regularly, and now I will admit there was alcohol involved. I used to have a thing where I would stick a card in my glasses, so I remember to use the damn thing, and then my turn would go around the board twice, and I'd be like, what's this card? Oh, shoot, that's what I was supposed to do. At least have some plan in mind. I don't think I've ever played a game where it's so random that I couldn't plan something unless you're getting into like super party games like King of Tokyo. I can't really plan ahead. That is a game where I have to wait till the dice are in front of me. Look at the board state, roll the dice and make a decision. But most games I play, there's at least something I can plan ahead. Yeah, like, you know, can't stop Can't really plan the head on uh, during on no. can't stop. But that's, you know, that's one of the few. Uh, Even in that, though, it could be like you're waiting for certain numbers. And if those come up, you know exactly what you're going to do. That's what, like there's always seems like there's something. Yeah, I mean, even you plan ahead. Yahtzee, you can have a goal. You know, you're aiming yeah. for the you're aiming for the long straight today. You right. Know, you're like, oh, time. I didn't yeah. get that. OK, now I got to think. Yeah. Definitely. So planning your moves is huge. That is a big one. <laughs> uh, next, even if you can't plan your move, do pay attention when it's not your turn. So you're not starting to think about what to do when it's your turn. Even highly random games, seeing what other people are doing should affect your plans. I'm going to jump back to King of Tokyo since that, that's, that might be my recurring theme here. Is I at least, I don't have to look and go, okay, who's in Tokyo? Okay, who's out? Okay, who has the most points? Don't be that person, please. You're just going to slow down everything for everyone. Yes, if this person's a new gamer and they're just learning the game, answer their questions. But in general... At least pay attention to what's going on. Plus, it's just polite. It's a it's social contract. It's the thing to do. You're all there to play a game. Play attention to the game, even if it's a social event. Put the phone down. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh... Next, be aware when it is your turn. If more than once you're told, hey, it's your turn to go, you're part of the problem. We get it. Now and then you get distracted, right? You had to go to the washroom. That's totally excusable. You're on your phone now and then. You know what? I don't make people put phones away. I, there, there's way too much going on in the world. People that need to pay attention to things. They're working. They might get important announcements. Whatever. I don't mind. As long as when it's your turn, you're ready to go. I don't care what you do. But if it comes up twice that you weren't looking at the table, you weren't looking at this, I'm like, hey, Sean, it's your turn. Then it's a problem. Yeah, I find one of the problems I, I've, I, I freely admit, I, I've had it many times, is certain games, uh, because of the different kinds of play that there can be you're expecting someone to do something and you're waiting for them to do it and they've done something completely different that you totally missed so you yeah. have no idea it's your turn that sort of things happens it, it uh, happens. but i mean you know pay attention if no one's doing anything ask if someone has gone yeah. maybe you admit that you've but you've possibly missed something and and ask uh don't just sit around until someone says hey it's your turn yeah and i gotta say i don't know how many times that if there's a meme out there there's gotta be where the person goes, whose turn is it? It's their turn. Like, like there's, there's usually about a 75% chance <laughs> if someone asks, whose turn is it? It's theirs. Yep. yep. Now, another thing, if you are playing a learning game or you're playing a casual game or you're on a time limit, don't spend as much time thinking. Yes, some players want to plan out every move, but that's not always the most appropriate way to play. This goes back to the discussion before game. If this is you and you know it's you, don't agree to play a casual game. Don't want to play like, hey, we're just playing a learning game. We're playing to fire, play who finds out. Don't be that player who's going to take 10 minutes on the turn to squeeze one more point out or, or be the one that's like, well, I'm going to gain three points, but they're going to lose two, which gives a spread of five, which isn't quite. You're playing a casual game, play a casual game. Yes, there is a place for that other style of game, which should be discussed before the game starts and be like, all right, we're going to take this one seriously. Let's see who's the better player. Let's go. Totally legit. That's part of that discussion before game. If you, especially a learning game or casual game, don't take learning games seriously. Like that should, should be a rule that everyone should do. You're learning the game. Your first play is a learning game. I don't care how many videos you watched, how many times you read the rule book. Maybe if you've done a demo, you might have that little edge, but it's a learning game and everyone should treat it as such. And similarly, if you are teaching people and you've played the game many times, don't be the jerk who's just stomping all over. You don't have to throw the, throw the game, but at the same time, you don't have to put all your effort into making sure that yes. they pay because they don't know the optimal, optimal play solutions yet. Uh, which, which goes good with my next point, and this is something everyone can do, is ask slower players or players who look lost or who are taking a long time if they want help. I often do this when teaching a game. 
Note the important part here, though, is ask. Do not give unsolicited advice. Ask if they want help. I'll offer players options what they can do. I don't tell people how to play. I just point out, maybe you haven't seen this yet. Sean, I think the best example of teaching Sean a game where he saw that was Lost Ruins of Arnak, where he's like, I pass. And I'm like, okay, I just want to point out, if you're aware, you could spend this token to do this, to go up here, to go up here, to do this and do this, and then get that card, and that card will let you do that. So, you know, your turn doesn't have to be over, but if you want to pass, you can, right? Um, now, I'm not saying tell people how to play either. Just present the options so they're obvious to them. So players have all of their choices in front of them. Then as important as asking, make let them make the decision. Let that player decide what to do with the information you gave them. Yeah. And again, while we've talked a lot about what happens at the start of the game, discussing things in advance, make, getting everyone on the same page, it doesn't have to end there. During the game, there's no reason you can't say, hey, yeah. you know, we're, we're kind of, we're, things are, things are, slowing to a crawl here we've got a time limit you know the bar closes uh we have to be back at work let's um maybe we should probably try and do this otherwise we're gonna have to cut the game off short how do you guys want to do you finish this because it looks like we mm -hmm. might not make it through at this at this pace now that also applies to sh quicker games as well right like if, if you are having a problem and and you need to it, it applies to both like like the communication goes both ways if you're having a problem, let people know. Now, if you're playing a long game, you're like, you know what? I, I'm, I'm lost. Someone did something there, totally threw me off my game. I need to completely rethink my whole strategy. Uh, do you mind giving me a few minutes? That's perfectly fine to ask. I don't know why, why, I don't think it's gamers. I think it's people are so scared to talk to each other. Just communicate. Now, with a slow, slower game or a fast game, like fast paced game, you're like, hey, can we slow down a bit? I'm losing track of things or, or, Hey, can we take a short break? Like, I need to refocus. This is, or you know what? This is getting a little too intense with a, with real time games, especially. Is you know at the end of this round, can we take five minutes just to kind of let tensions and adrenaline kind of kind of wean off a little bit here? Yeah, absolutely. Again, there's nothing. Uh, safety doesn't end at the RPG table. It works at the board yep. game table too. And if you're getting overwhelmed, you've got a perfectly good reason to say, "Hold on, guys, this is too much." Yeah. No one should be thinking any less of you uh, and everyone else should have the feel the freedom to do that as well. And even then, it doesn't even have to be a safety issue. It just could be like, you know what? I'm a little overwhelmed. Like you don't have to be having a full on panic attack to stop a game. You can just say, you know what? I need a little more time to think. I, I, the, the pace of this game is a little more than I intended. Well, to me, it's a safety issue because it's you want to get to it before it becomes the panic attack. Yeah, true. Stop it, you know, stop it early. Stop stop it when you see things escalating. Yep. Because you don't want to have a full-on panic attack during a game. It, it's this is a game. That's yeah. now another thing you can do is adjust the player count. Um, I know adjust you can't really do it in the middle of a game. In some cases you can. But the the important thing to learn here, and and I I don't know, people seem to miss this. You don't have to play every board game at the highest player count possible listed on the box. People seem to think, oh, it's a five, two to five player game. That means it's a five player game. It's a two to six player game. Well, that means it's a six player game. No, just because it says it works at five doesn't necessarily mean at all that it's best at five. Now, I mean, the game Roger was not. hinting at. Yeah, yeah. Now, the game Roger was hinting at, we actually find best at three or four. Four's okay but way too long at five. We generally choose not to play at five. Well, I get that at a public play event, you want to get as many people involved in as many games as possible. Sometimes it's worth saying, you know, this will play five, but it's going to get long. So I need to make sure everyone's on board knowing it's going to take a long time to get around to your turn. And I fully understand if you want to get up and go do something else when it's not your turn, but please come back, you know, don't come back when it's your turn, come back like when you notice the player before it seems to be acting. So you can kind of catch up. Yeah, another good example is uh, and another Valeria game, Dice Kingdoms of Valeria. You know, we were told by the designer, hey, yeah, you know what? It'll play five. And they're right. The game plays at five, but yeah. it stretches on and it wears out its welcome at five, unfortunately. Uh, there's a reason why they, the publisher put it at four, uh, because it's a more enjoyable experience with yeah. that one less player. No, nope, totally agree. And then the thing we've said a million times in the podcast, so as far as I know, no one ever listens to because I've never seen anyone else do it. 
is remember you don't have to finish every game you start if things are going too long and everyone looks bored it's okay to say hey is everyone still having fun because if we're not we can end it you can end the game at a shorter point total again you want that eight hour game of Catan. i'm going to come back to these same same ones you want an eight hour game of or an eight hour game of Catan. sorry a one hour <laughs> game of Catan. play to eight points that's where the eight comes from play to eight don't play to ten you want an eight hour game of Catan? go somewhere else Oh, it's <laughs> some people seem to take that long to play because that's usually because people are refusing to trade with each other, which make trades, just make sure that to your advantage and the opponent, make sure each getting a, a equal share. Catan without trading is not fun. But anyway, um, like end the game shorter too. like, like just play one more round, like read the game. Um, we'll, we'll go to cast ones of Valeria. It, it is a five round game. And that one's a little hard to cut part way through. You want to cut out two rounds if you do that one. Because of the way the scoring works, where you score different districts, so every district scores three times, you want to do it so every district scores twice. So you don't want to cut out the last round, but you might want to cut out the middle two so that everything scores an equal amount. But there's no reason not to do that. There's also a way to go, you know what? We're stopping. The, the bar closes at 10. At 9.50, we're going to stop. Whoever has the most points at 9.50 wins the game. And actually, cutting out the last one would be fine because you've still scored all the real, all everything twice. Yeah. I personally, I think the score everything is more important than the score each district, but. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I get that. But uh, yeah, no, definitely. And, and one of the other things is if you're playing a co-op, if you can see that it's a loss, mm -hmm. don't play it out. And you don't have to drag it out to the very yep. end to know that the big baddie has wiped the table with you all completely. <laughs> many, many times it's obvious that this is this is a, a lost cause folks let's you know does anyone really want to try and try and you know that one percent chance that we can do this or should we just sort of wrap it yeah. up here it's okay there's nothing wrong with that and similarly even in a competitive game if there's a runaway leader problem or if you think there's no way you can win you can offer to concede now the trick is this is again part of communication and your table culture and your social contract ask don't just concede. Say, is it okay? Like, I, I, I'm done. This is, I can't possibly win this. I want to back out. Now, in some games, you still need to be in. It's an area majority game or whatever. Whatever you do is going to impact the final end for the players who do want to finish. Then you need to get permission to do this. Don't just walk away. Um, but there's no reason to, to, to not have, like, have the conversation. Again, it's, it's all about communication. You sit there and you go, you know what? There is no chance I can keep up. I'm having no impact on this game. I'm going to go play something else or whatever. I'm going to go on my phone for a bit. This way, you're not going to get mad at me for not paying attention. <laughs> I'll have permission to go do it over there and play some puzzle quest. And you guys finish up or the opposite. Like Sean's obviously won. like no thing we can do in the next two turns can earn us the 62 points. He's already got none of us have the resource. Why don't we just call it Sean wins? Like there's no reason not to do that. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's jump back to a couple of the actual questions Roger asked. Right. Starting with what kind of game pace? Do you generally prefer? All right. So I'm less Goldilocks than Roger. I will say I, I like games with all kinds of pace. Now I dig real time, short time limit games. I a couple examples are fuse and break dancing meeple, but I also love long event games like say your twilight imperiums. What I don't like are games with too many options that lead to AP when playing with those players who have to figure out every option. Now, I'm going to go back to the start of the conversation. Look at this full circle, Ouroboros here. We're going to go back to Five Tribes. I did not like that game at all the first time I played it because I played with a player that did want to figure out every possible option to find the one that got them one more point. And it was a terrible experience. Now, another example, though, is playing Indonesia with a heavy ward gamer where turns took forever ever because they were trying to get every little advantage and figure out just before they split the market on something how to get a couple extra dollars and another one was playing steam with a literal mathematician who was taking notes and doing calculations between turns and it'd be like no no hold on i still have two more goods to figure out the net value of and we're like okay all right go ahead figure out the net value you know you're winning like just no matter which one you buy, you're still going to win. I don't like games with a lot of talking either as part of the turns. This is what Sean was talking about 
with the interaction between the players. I tend to avoid negotiation games, social deduction games, and games like that. Now, the perfect example of this one for being too long would be Diplomacy. This is a game where sometimes players take months to play with actual backroom dealings going on. But even in a quick afternoon game that I've witnessed, there's all kinds of, hey, come over here. Oh, come in the other room. Why don't we go to the bathroom together so we can make our, our thing before everyone writes down their moves and actually takes a turn? It can drag on forever. So all of these for me are actually, though, if you look at it, more about the people than the games. Most of these are fixed when having those initial discussions. Okay, we are going to play diplomacy, but we're going to limit negotiations to five minutes and we're going to set a time limit. Or we're going to play I did five tribes and we're not going to figure out every possible thing. If we have to, we'll set a time limit. The style of games I prefer not, there are styles of games I prefer not to play with certain styles of gamers. And I know that. So when invited to a game, if I realize that a mismatch is about to happen, I'll just turn down the play. While I enjoy most games at any pacing level, I would say the sweet spot for me is when it gets to a player's turn, they start taking their turn right away. They start doing actions ready, right away. They have the ability to plan ahead and then just have to enact their move on their turn. Where people do the thinking off turns, between their turns. That same game can, of course, have a few surprise moments where players need a bit more time, right? Let something change. Oh, no, I have to think but about this. And to me, those are usually exciting, tense moments where the other players all watch to see how they react to it and how the board's going to change. Because up until then, we've just been kind of flowing. And then, oh, the shift, the shift happened, the twist. Now, what are they going to do? That's the type of game and pacing I enjoy. Yeah, I'm learning more and more that I prefer games sort of at the either end. Um, either quick, light, fair, not real time, but uh, card games where you just get into a game quickly playing, not almost, uh, automatically, but close. Um, and you can have that chat all the way down to that bigger, meatier games, the the weather machines, the, you know, the, those big involved three plus, four plus uh, weight games that are going to take more time, but everyone knows they're taking more time. Everyone is going mm -hmm. to be thinking because you've got a, you know, a, a wide range of options and you can only do two of the eight actions, even though you want to do all of them. <laughs> yep. uh, it's those ones in the middle where you really can't chat, but it's really easy to overthink and get bogged down. Those are the ones that I struggle with. Now, Roger's other question was, can you discuss a few examples of very fast or very slow paced games? Why don't we go with three each? Okay. So as mentioned at the start of this, uh, again, remember game pace isn't the same as game length. So the first game I want to highlight is the game we reviewed last week, uh, Cast Ones of Valeria. This is a great example of a longer game that has a great pace. There is a lot going on and there are a lot of different options and there's iconography and things you have to overcome to learn the game. But once you actually learn the game, each turn, your options are fairly limited. You're only going to take three options. You're either going to get a bonus or you're not. And doing each of the individual actions is fairly quick and simple. And most of the actions are basically the same thing. You are going to pay for something and put it on the map. Then get any bonus for doing that. That's pretty much what you do most turns in the game. There's some exceptions like shipping and going to the wharf and some of the placing things on map trigger other things. But like the basics are pay a resource, pay gold for how many of the thing are already on the board and put it out there and then wait for the scoring round to see if you win that area. Once everyone has the basics down, that game just flows really smoothly, I found. And it's one of those games where I don't realize how long I've been playing it. It feels like I've been playing for a half hour, 45 minutes. And I look and go, oh, geez, we've, we've been here. The, the, the coffee shop's closing. <laughs> All right. I guess we're only getting one game in today. Now, I'm going to go with a game that for me doesn't have great pacing, but is still yep. a really fun game and a game we all like. This is Roll Camera. Now, in this case, it's because you've got a co-op game with a lot of decision points mm -hmm. and points of view on the best way forward. Turns can really slow down as because you're all trying to work out an optimal solution with what you've got. Mm -hmm. uh, you're rolling dice each turn, so there's a random 
aspect that is going to throw a wrench into any pre-planning you might do. There are communication limitations, so you can't even talk about all the things you might want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that interaction, unlike many Euro style games, really adds to that inconsistent turn length. Yeah. Uh, the B movie expansion added a huge amount of replayability, but it also added even more decision points with which to yeah. discuss. So as much as we really enjoy roll camera, its pacing isn't ideal. And it's one you definitely want to have a talk about if you were going to play yeah. that, say a public play event. Yeah, that one's, that one's weird. The pacing. And, and I think the biggest thing is some turns are super quick. Like the pacing's like, I rolled the dice. I got what we needed. Boom. We film a film. We did a thing. Let's put a new thing out. Awesome. High five. Your turn. And then and other turns and now it's like, a 20 minute discussion because yeah, you just like, flipped oh, out could, a new I could card. put out this set piece or I could use this die. Oh, don't forget you can hire an intern. Oh, that's right. I could hire an intern, but then we have a new problem. How are our pro like and and like both in the same game? It's oh, it's yeah. strange. Like it's a real roller coaster of yeah, pacing. Yeah. Un uneven pacing is I think the biggest uh way to, to describe yeah. roll camera. No, I agree. On uh, my next example, I'm gonna bring up Terraforming Mars. Now, not because I think the pacing in that game is perfect. Actually, I think it's actually a little slow. But I want to bring up the impact of one sp uh, the the impact of one ex expansion and the impact it had on pacing in the game because I think it's noteworthy. So, when you first play Terraforming Mars, even long time fans of the game, people played it fifty times. You start off every game a little lost. You have a bunch of cards to choose from and a corporation to pick. And unless there's that very clear synergy between those cards, you have no idea what type of strategy to adopt. And it's really difficult to decide what cards to keep and which corporation to pick, unless you already have, like you played a bunch of games, you have a preferred play style, then maybe there's some way to get you to go. But especially with new players, I hate teaching this game to new players because I'm handing them a beginner corp. So at least it's one less decision and 10 cards and going go. And they're just lost. And of course they're lost. And it's not a game where I can be like, show me your cards. So honestly, whenever I teach this game, I prefer to facilitate and I will help the new players as opposed to just letting them sink or swim. Yeah. Then you've gotten past that first decision point, right? Game starts. You're still stuck with a random deck. And especially if you're, if you've either way you play, like I realize there's two different ways to play where you get random cards at the start of your turn. Or you draft both ways. Like you're like, oh, I got these five cards to draft from. They still don't go with anything I have. I don't know. I'm going to look at the board. I'll be like, eh, this game, I guess I'm going to go for, let's try to get lots of steel. I, I, it just, everyone else gets the same thing and everyone's trying to find a system, right? This is an engine builder. They want to start building their engine and, and it leads to a ton of downtime. Because players are presented with too many equally good seeming options and no clear direction on which way to go. So I will say the pacing in the early game of Terraforming Mars was terrible, like to the point that I refused to play the game without the expansion, which the chat room's already figured out what we're talking about. And that is the Prelude expansion. This expansion gives the game a kickstart, nothing to do with Kickstarter. It, it, it gives you a kick in the butt. Oddly, by presenting you with more options. But these are options that clearly favor distinct strategies. They not only give you direction, a clear, I am going to take these prelude cards because they go with that corporation to give me a direction so that when I am drafting cards or getting my random cards and deciding what to keep, I can work towards a thing. But they also give you a starting engine and resources to run it a few times so the game pace gets going quicker. So there's no longer the I can't afford to play anything. I've done almost nothing. Yeah, I put this up by one. You start having meaningful, engaging turns quicker. Like I am just amazed by how much Prelude fixed the pacing issue in Terraforming Mars. Now, I know there are people out there that still hate it. And that still find it too slow. And that's still, well, it's, it's right, the game turns and AP being too slow, the pace too slow, and the game too long. I get it. I understand that the game's not for everyone even now. So a long game that I think does pacing right is Lost Ruins of Arnak. 
Now, I said the game did it right. That doesn't mean it isn't without pacing issues. The problem with Arnak, or at least some players in combination with Arnak, is the decision tree. Yeah. If you aren't as familiar with the game and what some of the optimum paths are, you can get lost in trying to work out the best pathway all the way down your decision tree towards your, your final outcome. And that way lies madness. There's a lot of <laughs> possibilities here. But if you pay close attention and spend the other players' turns working through your options, you should be more or less ready to go when it gets to be your turn. Mm -hmm. And there's very little player interaction to trip you up. Yes, someone yeah. might take your camping spot, but that's about it. Yeah, they might kill the monster you wanted to kill or take your spot. Though I got to say, losing the spot you needed can be devastating in that game. But going to those games that I like perfect pacing on, I think Arnak is one of those. Because it comes my turn, I'm ready to go unless that big twist happens that, oh, you totally cut me off. Okay, and that's where I say it's going to be a bit because everything I planned, you just ruined, which to me is part of the fun of the game, actually. Uh, now, because those were two long games, I wanted to go with a short game. I wanted to go with it with a short, quick, rapid fire, super low, um, low, low pace, low, slow pace, fast pace, not, not low pace, fast pace. Sorry, I'm like the opposite. Um, to me, that would be I, what I'm looking for in, in a short game. Because I don't really love party games. I don't love highly random games are games that give you player agency while still being quick. And these aren't easy to find. Most short games are random. And to be fair, I enjoy randomness in short games more because the games are over quick and I don't care that I lost due to random factors. So I'll play a game, right? Party, push your luck style games. They're fine. I enjoy them. But what I want for a game when it is that when it's over in 15 minutes, I can look at the table and I can be like, I know what I would have done different. I know how I could have played better, or I can see what my opponent did to beat me. There, there is definite agency. What affected it was because of what other players do. So an example of this that we just discovered is Trick Draw. This is a super quick playing card game that's a race to 10 points. The rules are dead simple. Draw a card, play a card. When you play it, put it face up. Or sorry, put it face down. And it counts as one point out of 10. So you get 10 face down cards, you win or put it face up and use the ability on the card. Now, the real brilliance of the game comes from those abilities. They let you play more cards, draw more cards, flip over cards. Not even necessarily your cards. You can flip your opponent's cards over. Now, we've had a game that lasted less than five minutes, and we've had our longest game under half an hour. And each time, while it may not have felt like I necessarily did something wrong, wrong and lost, I could always see there are things I could have done to play better. Yeah. Now, absolutely. another example of this that may be more easily available, uh, Trick Draw's just hitting the market now. Hey, new hotness on our show again, um, would be Stefan Feld's Revolution of 1828. And I'm pretty sure Sean will agree with me on that one for the pacing on the back and forth. For a rapid fire game, that is a rewarding experience. Yeah, that one is literally just, you know, it, it's, it, it makes it look like a checkers game almost. You know, you're just, yep. you're just reaching down and clicking. Uh, for a short game with a quick pace that I like, Look no further than point salad. Mm. As long as you're watching the play and not with your hand and your phone, there's only nine cards to choose from. And only, at most, two of them will have changed from the last player. That's it. Yeah. Uh, there aren't going to be that many cards in your tableau. So your decision space is really limited. Uh, my goal, my thing with point salad, and I've been surprisingly successful with it, is get your target early. You know, figure yeah. out your goal cards early. And and don't Build just towards them. don't don't kind of you know oh I'll figure out something as I go because then you can kind of, kind of drag it out for everybody and you it, it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. Uh, point salad is a great one. The pace in that game, though, every now and then, again, players need to take a moment. Like, oh, hold on. The, the biggest thing I find in point salad, it's it's more a matter of if you're not because it, it can be a casual game where you're chatting and stuff like that. You might have to do the take a moment to look at whatever point cards everyone has. Whereas, yes, if you're all focused on the game, you probably are aware of that. But Point Salad's light enough and casual enough to me that, that really the only downtime in that game is if you weren't paying attention on what other players were doing until. Although I like it if D doesn't pay as much attention and doesn't notice yeah, that, I, that I can score 12 points for every uh, pepper in front of me. Uh. So do we want to bring up anything from the chat before we get to a summary of what we talked about? So well, I think we've got a lot of uh, a lot of similar thoughts in there yes uh some person is bringing up race for the galaxy is a great pace and i have to disagree 
Um, I think at least in my experience, and maybe it's just me because I'm not the biggest race fan, I find race can lead to some real AP um, and that can can make for uneven pacing. Yes, if everyone is is super familiar with everything, mm -hmm. but uh, any anyone who isn't at that upper level of race, you drop them in the game and all of a sudden you hit a real stall point as they yes. try to figure out what the heck it is they're supposed to do. Which what I want to do is I want to take that and add that to another factor that affects pace that we didn't talk about. So I appreciate that getting called out just so we can call out that we missed experience. The more you know a game, the quicker you'll be able to play that game. And system mastery is huge. Race for the Galaxy two-player is a fantastic quick game, as long as both people have played Race for the Galaxy two-player a number of times and generally know the composition of the cards. They know what's out there, what to expect. They, they know what expansions are in play. They know the odds of going for a Rebel versus trying to do an uplift and what's going to work. And it's great that way. But again, when playing with someone who doesn't have that experience, it can drag. Uh, Tapestry is another one. And remember how long our first few games of Tapestry were compared to how quick we were firing through a game on Board Game Arena eventually. Yeah, absolutely. And Board Game Arena has come up several times uh, in the chat, uh, both for the ability to take time in a non-real-time yep. game, but there's also the ability to play real-time and fire at, fire through it. And, you know, people who want to have too much AP are penalized for that. Yep. Um, that's definitely there. Yeah, Deanna, I noticed, called out specifically, there are certain games she'd rather play on Board Game Arena because she is one of those players who would like to spend more time planning but cuts herself short at the table so that everyone else is having a fun experience. She's doing the thing where she's just making a point, make a decision, right? Do something, even though she knows there might be a better move. Whereas in the right format, uh, board game arena being perfect for that, you can take as long as you want. Well, within some limitation, <laughs> but you can take hours before taking your turn. Yeah. And the same thing's also true. If you're taking about like, uh, I don't know if we mentioned this, we kind of mentioned it in, passing a couple different ways is how seriously are you taking the game is going to impact the pacing. What I've always been absolutely fascinated by is the difference in game length. When we have a casual game night anywhere, could be at the local game store, could be at my house, could be anywhere, compared to when I run a great Canadian board game blitz. When we're running a blitz, the games are finished like lightning fast compared to playing at home. And it's all because of that focus, right? You're just playing. And when you were playing in a tournament for prizes, you are paying attention. You better be. <laughs> I assume you're going to be paying more attention and you're not chit-chatting and doing whatever and having fun and rolling the dice and laughing about the silly thing that happened. Instead, you're going, okay, that silly thing happened. That's not good. That's messing with my strategy. What do I do next? Uh, several people were talking a little bit about uh, when a game, you know, when your turn is done, uh, say something. Or if you had a bar, knock on a table or something, just, you know, depending on the type of game, it may be appropriate to, you know, give some indication to the next person that you're done yep. and not just assume that they saw, saw you take your turn. Amusing anecdote related to that one. So we talked about last week, we got Kings in the Corner. And I think it's just from years of playing card games with my parents at the Knights of Columbus, uh, sometimes with strangers, when I finished my turn every time in that game, I knocked on the table. I don't do that when playing Terraforming Mars. Maybe I should, but just like it was just like part of the game. Like I'm playing a card game. I have and it's a game where you can make multiple moves like you, you, you play a card. You can move a card. You can move another card. And it's also a game where if you miss something, you could lose and it could be obvious. So your opponent's just waiting for that knock to go. Ha! You missed this move. So like totally like just automatically. I'm like the the and like Deanna was doing it as well, probably because I was doing it. But it was just like it was like a built in reflex. And yeah, I, I would say. Um, and another example is we used to play another game and we, we have an inside joke, which I don't know if we mentioned on the show before, but, but pass the carrot where we used to pass a, a, something physical to players to show whose turn it is. So they wouldn't forget. Um, which again, I, the, the joke was, it was my, one of my birthdays at the Knights of Columbus and it was a game of 31 with like, I don't know, 18 players. And there was a carrot we were passing around and I ate the carrot because, you know, I was distracted <laughs> and then we lost it. So the, now the rule is don't eat the carrot. So that's that's the reminder of keeping track of whose turn it is. All right. Roger brings up uh, if you're if you're not going to finish that game, you can tell people, hurry up, make your mistakes before we restart. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. 
No, the, 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 again, communication's big. Um, do we have anything else from the chat before I get to a... I think that hits all the big I, points That hits there. most of them. We do appreciate everything you said. Even if we don't call it out, we will be jumping into the lobby. Maybe we'll chat a bit more. Um, so in summary, realize that game pacing isn't the same as game length. You can have a long game that goes that, that, that flows well. I guess pacing and flow are kind of similar in a way. I, I hadn't really brought it up before. And you can have a slow game that just, man, it takes too, way too long to get to your turn. A Yahtzee with some players I've had, or even Uno. I have played a game of Uno where someone was taking way too long to figure out what card to play. Different people are going to prefer different pacing, and that's not a bad thing. The important thing is to discuss it before you start playing and make sure everyone's on the same page. Then, once the game starts, do your part to maintain the pace that was discussed, and don't be afraid to communicate while playing. If someone's taking too long, or if you need more time, or if you need to speed things up, all of that are things that is perfectly cool to talk about. The social contract of the game, unless you're in some kind of tournament space, is not we must all sit in silence and play the game until it's done. All right, well, that's it for our discussion on board game pacing. Thanks again for the question, Roger. Now, what are your thoughts on game pacing? What's your favorite pace? Let us know in the comments below. Now, if you've got a topic you'd like us to cover, it doesn't necessarily have to be a question, just something you want to hear us discuss. You can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop, or you can email your question to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Just remember, we have discussed Minotaur Milk on the show yes, in the past. Yes, we have. Join us for a look at Leading the Charge, the third expansion for Disney's Sorcerer's Arena from the op, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy. Like the expansions that came before it, Leading the Charge does require a copy of Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. If this is your first time hearing about Sorcerer's Arena, or you're just interested in learning more before hearing about this review, check out our Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances core set review on the blog, YouTube, or as part of episode 201 of our podcast. I also invite you to check out our reviews of the first two expansions, Turning the Tide and Thrills and Chills, which you can find in the same spots. Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliance's Leading the Charge comes from Sean Fletcher and the Op. It was published earlier this year and has an MSRP of $19.99 US dollars. As we've grown to expect from these Sorcerer's Arena expansions, you get three new characters along with any new rules to support them. Now, in, those case, in this case, those characters are Buzz Lightyear from Toy Story and, while well, later, his own movie, Scar from The Lion King, and Elsa from Frozen. Now, as far as new rules go, the only thing here is a new status effect. Now, you can check out what you get in the box through our Leading the Charge unboxing vid on YouTube, and we'll also note that unlike the other two expansions, there is no, uh, not yet an errata for this set as of recording. It does show that the player guide will be coming soon on their website, though, so you'll want to check when you get your copy. In general, you get the same thing as we've seen in all of these so far. A plastic insert that's really only good for getting the stuff to you in good shape. Pen cards for each character, bigger character cards, one for each character. A single folded sheet explaining how to use this expansion, though one whole page is an ad because there's so little new stuff here. Some punch boards and the standees. Now, as you can see in the unboxing, there is a big change here in regards to the standees that I was very happy to see. They are now packaging these differently, and I don't know if the second printings of the original expansions are going to do this the same, but I hope they do. They now come in a very tight, small Ziploc bag and are stacked in a specific order. This was done because now there's only one piece of plastic film on one side of each of the standees and bases, and that film is much easier to remove than the previous film, which was a big relief to me. I really did hate the film on these tokens in the core box and previous expansions. Did we mention that the film was problematic earlier on? <laughs> now, it's also worth noting that the quality of these components all perfectly matches that which is in the other set. No color differences to set the cards apart or anything like that. Now, as for new rules, there's really not a lot to talk about here. First off, there is the rule for constant abilities, but this has been in every single one of Sorcerer's Arena expansion so far, so we're not going to cover it again here. I figure this one's probably going to end it up adding into the rules for the base set at some point in a, later, in a later printing, since it has been in every single one of the expansions. Then there's a new static effect that Elsa can generate called Invulnerable. 
when damage would be dealt to a character with the invulnerable that prevents the damage and removes the invulnerable. So it's a one-time protection. Yep. Now, moving on to the characters, we'll cover each of them. First, we have Scar, who's a really nasty character who's all about being the king of the hill and controlling the victory point squares in the arena. His skill bumps a rival off a victory point space, and then Scar takes his spot. All that costs is any movement card for any character discarded. Then when on that spot, all the rivals, all your enemies, heal less every time they're healed. Now to make this nastiness, add to this nastiness, make it a little worse, he is also one of, as far as I know, only two, but few characters in the game that can cause an opponent to lose crowns they've already earned. Now along with this, he's also a very solid control character, who can often move his allies along with him, which is great for controlling the board. And then true to character, Scar also has the ability to earn crowns by taking out one of his own with his treacherous plot card. Now, Elsa is one of the most thematic characters we've seen, and the way that her deck highlights her own hatred of her own magic is extremely well done. This comes out through her ability to draw cards from her deck and keep the non-magical cards she draws, as well as her ability to banish, banish her own magic cards to make her invulnerable. In addition, being able to become invulnerable combined with many cards that immobilize rivals in ice make her a solid defensive character. Mm -hmm. She combos particularly well with characters who also dig into your deck, but on the opposite side are looking for magic cards, Though in that case, you may want to limit the, ban limit the banishing. Finally, we've got Buzz Lightyear, who's one of the best range damage dealers in the game. Now, his core skill is do one damage to an opponent that's already been damaged who is exactly two squares away. So Buzz becomes all about being in the right place at the right time. Now, this combos with a number of ranged and melee damage cards, including one that hits opponents one, two, and three squares away. As for getting into the right spot, his deck also has a number of powerful movement cards, including one that lets him bring an ally with him, covering up to half of the board, and an ability that lets him move through rivals and draw cards in the process. So, what did you think of these new characters? So of the three, Scar was the most interesting. I love playing Scar, and I hate playing against Scar. With Scar in the arena, your whole strategy has to change especially if you usually focus on controlling the victory point squares, or hexes, I should say, they're not squares. This is especially true if you like to play a character that needs you to use those spots. For example, if I am playing Sorcerer's Arena and we are doing a draft at the beginning of the game and my opponent drafts Scar, there is no way I'm taking the Horn King. Indeed, and it's characters like this and, and choices like this that they've built into the game that really bring out the strength of that mm -hmm. drafting system as opposed to people just showing up with their favorite team every time. Next up, I really enjoyed playing Buzz Lightyear, and I also like playing against him. The big focus in both cases is that exactly two hexes away rule. When facing him, I'm always watching exactly where all my characters are, standing and where they're positioned, and trying to always end my turns either next to him, where possible, and using abilities like Immobilize or Afraid to make sure he can't get into that right position. When playing him, it's trying to make sure you get that skill to go off every single round if you can, as well as upgrading him as quick as possible, because then he does even more damage. Timing can be important here, so you need to think about where he's going to be in the initiative line against other mm -hmm. players when drafting. I also enjoyed playing Elsa in the few games I've gotten to use her in. I've yet to find a perfect combo for her, but I do love how frustrated my opponents get when that invulnerable status comes up. At some point, I need to try to team her up with Sorcerer Mickey and Fusilier and see if I can actually set it up so that no matter what, I can always draw the top card of my deck because I'll already know it from the previous character. So I should know what it works. It should work in theory, but I've yet to actually try that combo myself. Yeah, I think she's got a lot of potential, but it will be interesting to see if they nerf her at all when they do release that player guide eventually. True. Really, though, overall, all three of these characters are cool. I, I would happily play and, and, and any of them. I would happily draft any of these characters. They all have their own merits. They're all fun to play. They even work pretty good as a combo with the three, just those three characters, as well as playing them with other characters. Like, I, there's, there's no character I don't like here. Yeah, this is really a solid character package overall, if not much more than that, just that. 
Yeah, that's that's my only real disappointment with this one is we didn't get some cool new rules. We we like like we got new terrain tiles with turning the tide and we got ocean tiles on the board that kind of changed the flow of the game or with the last expansion with thrills and chills, you got character tokens. I was really hoping to see this third expansion because those other two were out to maybe use those rules or give me something totally new. Well, I would have loved to have seen the two expansions previous lead to this one kind of in a tree. Like have Elsa generate ice arena tiles or have Scar have Fausa character tokens. I think that would have been brilliant. Yeah, it's uh, again, limited by the abilities in the mobile game there as well. So they've got to they've got to sort of deal with uh, keeping within that that lane that's been established for them. See, I wonder if they do have to keep that up. Like so far, they're sticking to it. How I wonder if the game will branch off more as time goes on. Of course, the opposite side of this is that the of the three expansions that are out there, this one's simplest. Like it's definitely the easiest to integrate to the core game or to teach new players because there's nothing new to learn. You have three new characters and one really simple to understand status effect. Yeah, in fact, this might be a good first buy if you're mm-hmm. looking to expand as it really doesn't overwhelm what you're already used to with all that much new. Uh, just the constant effects that everything has now. Yet again, the op has provided another great expansion for a great game. Uh, three new characters for Sources Arena that are a lot of fun to play, and I gotta say, quite challenging to play against. Uh, the lack of new rules makes this particular one the most accessible of the three, I would say, and would actually, as Sean just said, I think this would be my recommendation for anyone thinking, if you're gonna buy the core game in just one expansion, or you own the core game and you're curious about the expansions, this is the one I would go with. Even for those picking up all three, this is probably the one I would start with. And I've got to say props to the op for hearing the complaints about the film and doing something about it. Well, that's it for our look at the Leading the Charge expansion for Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances, the third and last expansion released so far. That is until At the Ready hits later this year. Of the three expansions released for this game so far, what one interests you the most and why? Tell us about it in the comments. Or better yet, head over to our Discord at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Start up a conversation. Sometimes we really are about the new hotness. Join us for a look at Mr. Lovenstein Presents No Context, a new game from Skybound. We have to thank for our review copy. This is hitting the store shelves at the end of this month. Mr. Lovenstein presents No Context, which I'm just going to pretty much call No Context going forward because that's a long title, is a party game based on and which features artwork from the popular Mr. Lovenstein webcomic by J.L. Westover. This game was designed by Banana Chan and Jason Slingerland. Plays two to six players, ages 13 and up, mainly due to some slightly adult content. A full game takes about half an hour to an hour, depending on how many people are playing. This game will be released on May 31st, 2023, the day after this podcast goes live with an MSRP of $24.99. So No Context is a party game that feels to me like a mashup of Ven, Dixit, and Mysterium. Players are randomly assigned one pane of a Mr. Lovenstein comic as their target. They then draft three additional panel cards that either have something or nothing to do with their target. While this is happening, players bet on which target they think the other players have. After all bets are placed, everything is revealed and points are scored. Now, the real joy of the game comes from players attempting to justify their drafting choices. Now, this game comes in a small box with a cover immediately recognizable to anyone familiar with Westover's work. Inside, you find a clear rulebook, large player board, a deck of voting and target cards, and a ton of square comic panel cards. All of this is held in a cardboard box insert that does a good job of holding the components. Component quality here is good, uh, though the board's big. I really did not expect how much space this was going to take up. Like This board is big enough. It's got to hold three cards for each of six characters. But then extending past the board, you also have slots at the top and bottom for seven more cards. This means it takes up a lot of table space for a party game. This is not going to fit on your average round card table even. You're going to need something a little bigger. Yeah, moving on to an overview of play. A full game of No Context is played over three rounds. Each round, players are assigned a target, 
draft cards related to that target, and place bets. After all bets are placed, points are awarded. At the end of the game, the player with the most points wins. Now to get each round started, you seed the board with target cards, and each of these cards is a square card that shows a comic panel. These get put above the board. Then you're also going to seed the bottom of the board with drafting cards, an equal number to the number of target cards, which is based on the player count. Players then take a set of numbered voting cards in their color and are randomly given a random target card, which they're going to keep secret from the other players. They're going to match the target number to the number at the top of the board to see which of the square cards is their target. On a player's turn, they will draft one card from the draft row, actually called the comparison row in the game, and place it on the board under their color then draw a new card to replace the one they took. Cards drafted should relate to their target card and can be placed in one of two ways. A green checkmark side saying, yes, this card has something to do with my target. Or mm -hmm. the red X side saying, this card is not in any way related to my target card. The choice of what card to draft and what side to use is very subjective here. Mm. There's no context. There's no right or wrong answer. Just be aware that part of the game is going to be having to explain why you chose that card to the other players. Play continues around the table with the next player drafting, placing, and refilling the market. Now, while all this is going on, and while this is happening, and people are drafting and placing cards, everyone and anyone can place bets. Now, the order of bets are placed matters, as points are awarded for the first and second correct bets only. Once bets are all placed, Players in turn reveal their target card and explain why they chose the cards they drafted. After this explanation and potential discussion, they then flip over the betting pile for their color. The first player to have guessed the right target takes two of the drafted cards. The second right get, uh, guess gets the third card. And then, if any bets were correct, the active player takes their own target card. Continue this for two more rounds, count up how many cards everyone has collected, and the player having the most cards wins. As expected from a party game like this, the actual rules are quite simple, and the fun comes from the interaction of the players more than the mechanics yeah. of the game. Yeah, the real fun here is the part where everyone has to justify their choices. Since, as the title of the game implies, when people are drafting and placing cards, you really have no context. You are sitting there trying to figure out why did that person choose that card, and let me tell you, the reasons I have heard after multiple plays with different groups of people are all over the place. Some players are going to draft based on the color. Oh, my card's yellow, and that's the only yellow here, so of course it's yellow. It's got a yellow background. Others are going to base it on the art. Well, that guy looks like he's sweating, and the card I have is about working out, so those are together. Some are based on their own past experiences. Well, you all know how much I hate shopping with my mom. Of course, this is related to the one where the guy's crying. Some people only read the words on the cards, totally ignoring the artwork. Other people draft cards based on the other cards they've already drafted. Some people even try to tell a story with all three cards, trying to give you a full webcomic with the target being a punchline. Yes, I played this game with a stand-up comedian. Most fascinating part of this game to me really is seeing how everyone thinks about it differently and makes connections different ways. The first round of play of this with new players is always fascinating to me because everyone has a completely different idea of how they're supposed to make those matches. Yeah, this of course is going to be the make or break aspect for most people looking at this game. Your ability and willingness to think on your feet and come up with reasoning, let alone announce it to the entire group, will often make this a must have or a never touch. This more than any other game we own really highlighted for me the way my two girls think very differently from each other and how my daughter, who has multiple sensory, sensory processing disorders, thinks about the world different from the rest of us. Now, while I found this fascinating, I could see how the game was impacted by just how well players know each other. Me playing with my daughters versus playing with strangers is completely different. Playing a six player game specifically that included two couples and me and my daughter it was very clear that the pairs were better able to bet on each other's plays than the semi-strangers were. And this is often going to be the case with most of these what are other people thinking games. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the most important part of the game, since the options are so limited on this uh, 
you know, from what yeah, you're this isn't like from. personal preference, and you know what flavor cake your kid likes. Like these connections are much more nebulous. So I wouldn't even say it's a problem, but it was evident. So it's a party game. This is one of those games that is all about the fun you're having together and not the score. The whole thing here is if you're laughing out loud at the justification of a card pairing, or you're sitting there cursing yourself for placing a bet, and then someone put a later card down, you're like, oh, no, that's not their target. Obviously, oops, I made a mistake. You are enjoying the game. You're, you're, you, you bet wrong. That's all part of it. You're, you're enjoying the game and having fun. And honestly doing it right, because there is no right or wrong answer for the cards that were drafted, which makes this game very accessible. While the score doesn't have to matter, the card collecting manner of scoring means you're less likely to completely ignore true. the score as you are with, say, telestrations. Yeah, that's true. Every game we played, people did want to know what their scores were at the end, but they weren't upset if they didn't get any points. The only time I actually saw people frustrated is when no one made the connection and they didn't even get to get their own card. Like, I'm playing with six feet and none of you got that connection. And usually we found that happened because everyone else got something else very wrong. Like someone put something down. Everyone's like, I know what that is. And everyone bets. And then you're like, oh, it wasn't that. Now, one concern I do have with this game is that if you play it a lot with the same group of people, that you get that group think and things might start to feel samey. This is going to be especially true if you play a number of times in a row and you get into the funk of drafting the same or similar cards for the same target. We've already gone through the deck multiple times when in my plays. Now, it's significant. It's a huge deck. I think it's 75 cards. It might be more. Don't don't quote me on the number of cards you get. We could probably look it up. Um, but it's going to your first game. You're probably not going to see them all. But by your second, third game, you will have seen everything. And it could happen that someone gets a target they've had before. And you could get into the thing that like, oh, well, anytime there is an animal up there, you're going to draft the tree for forest. You're going to draft the bunny because it's an animal and you're going to draft the draft with a gun. And yeah, every time Gwen plays, she always bases hers on color because that's the first way she thinks. So if, there, if she plays a blue up and there's only one blue, that's always her target. So we're definitely going to see that. And I've even had it already happen where we had a player draft a card. And when they were giving the reason, they were like, well, when the last time we played, mom used this card to represent this so therefore i drafted that card because i thought you'd realize that's the card mom used so due to this i think this is not the kind of game you're going to break out every saturday night this isn't going to be a hit that you're going to start every game night off with a game in no context this is going to be a game you bring out now and then uh, possibly on special occasions right this is this is a perfect adult beer and pretzel drinking game bring it out on new year's bring it out on birthdays bring it out for anniversaries Seems like the kind of game you're going to you're going to bring out maybe only a few times on your regular scheduled game night when you're like, oh, I need a break from the heavy game. I need something with a quicker pace. I'm going to break this out tonight. Now, this is also a game that I think is great when you're playing with new people or even strangers. I think it's a great public play event. I think what you need for this game to for the longevity of this game is to keep that wild card effect of playing with people you don't know very well to keep it fun and engaging. Yeah, the MSRP is hardly overwhelming for a game that might not get to the table as much as others. Yep. And that makes it much more approachable. Now, I'm sure most people listening know, know that I am not a big party game fan, though there are a few I do like, and I've got to throw no context in with those games. This game reminds me of the voting and justification from Dixit. You're voting on what you think the person's giving the hint for. And then when they're like totally way off, you're like, why? Why did you choose that? And then you get that matching and pairing of ideas that reminds me a bit of Ven, where you're trying to you visually communicate um, the linking things. Links, what do those two cards have in common or what do these cards not have in common? There's some logic there. And then the whole concept of Mysterium, where you are playing cards to communicate through visual. Well, that's exactly what you're doing in this game is there's my target. I am picking three clues to give you based on visual cues. So the, to me, it's kind of a tie-in of those games. And it, the, because of that, it's unique. It, it kind of stands out as different from anything else. Now, where I do think this game is really going to shine is as a get-to-know-you game. Something played early in a game night to break the ice and something to get people talking to each other and kind of get to know each other. But what I like about this one is you're not getting to know personal things about other players. You're not having to give away whatever, if you've traveled before, what your life dreams are, or what jobs you've had. Like the other get to know you games tend to be about your real life. This is more like how do you think and getting people talking and kind of getting to know the personality of the people more than learning facts. And I appreciate that. 
Yeah, of course, if you only play with your same group regularly, your familiarity with each other and after a few times with the game may hamper your enjoyment. Now, no context is a party game, right? While you're keeping score, it's not really about the it, it's it's not really about the score. It's more about the social experience. And because of that, this is not a game to play with anyone who's in it to win it. This is not a test or a contest. You're not going to be able to prove that you're a better no context player by grokking the meta. There's really nothing here to win over your Euro loving friends and family. Like, for example, my wife, Deanna, who will happily never play this game again. Yeah, deep, engaging gameplay with well thought out actions isn't the market here. No. It's about having fun with other people, period. Overall, I was impressed by Mr. Lovin's Team Presents No Context. It's a solid party game, a good mix of engaging mechanics and social interaction. I love that there's no bluffing or playing favorites or trying to vote on different, like you're voting, but you're voting on things, not players. You're not, you're not awarding anything to anyone. Rather, it's about trying to get inside each other's heads and figuring out why players are drafting certain cards and what their clues mean. If you're a party game fan, I think it's a great one to add to your collection. Despite having some similarities to existing games, it's its own game and really stands out as something different, but familiar. I think fans of the webcomic and the author's other work won't be sorry to have this in their collection, even if just as a display piece. And they may even get a game they find out they enjoy out of it. Now, if you generally avoid party games for things like having to lie to your friends, having to share information you may not be comfortable sharing, for overtly offensive content, or for being too much of a popularity contest, you might want to give no context a try. It avoids all of those things due to its unique target and voting system. So be aware there is some slightly adult content with cards like a depressed man sitting in a tub saying my wee wee doesn't work. I will admit uh, I am familiar with the artist's work, and I wouldn't call his work adult, but definitely more mature. I'd be fine letting my kids read his webcomics now, but a few years ago I would have hesitated. Now, if you play games to win and generally prefer heavier games, there's really nothing that's going to draw you to no context. While it may have more complexity than many really simple party games, it's still a social game about interacting with other players and not about who plays better or wins the game. There you have our thoughts on Mr. Levenstein Presents No Context, a game you will be able to pick up as soon as tomorrow if you're listening to this on the day it comes out. Now, I do dig a bit deeper into this game on my written review, which I invite you to check out over at tabletopbellhop.com. Dig the show? Enjoyed this review? Be sure to tip your bellhop by stopping by patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Uh, first up, family game night with the kids. Uh, it's Dee and myself and my girls, and we played a couple of new-to-me games. I actually in preparation for the Barbershop Bar event that was coming up on the weekend. Uh, the first of these was No Context, which we just finished reviewing. Um, the only thing I'll add on top of our review is just how well this played out of the box for the first time. There isn't really a learning curve for this game, and everyone um like got it right away and what was most fascinating it did take a round to fully understand what types of connections people are making there was no right or wrong answer so it was just fascinating every time i taught this game not even just this first play it's like oh you were focused on the color oh you were focused on the art oh you were focused on something that had nothing to do with what i was looking at and i thought that was really neat i didn't get a chance to play no context uh but i did get a, a chance to watch it uh, while I was having my dinner at the public uh, at the public events, uh, and it's it's a party game, you know, it's not high on that complexity. But honestly, I think I could have taught it taught it after watching around it getting played. Uh, next up was our first ever play of Outsmarted. This is a new trivia game from Q Play. If anyone could add Q Play to Board Game Geek, it'll tell you who published it because I don't know how to add a new publisher. Um, what this is, this is a modernization of Trivia Pursuit that is very much still Trivial Pursuit. Anyone who's played Trivial Pursuit is gonna, gonna see this and be like, oh, it's like they, they modernized, they made it, I don't wanna say it in a bad way, but they made it good. They, they, they fixed a lot of problems with Trivial Pursuit. Um, and honestly, at this point, I haven't even done the review yet, if you love Trivial Pursuit, if like, you have fond memories of playing it with your family, go pick this up. Because this is like a, a, ma a mashup of like classic roll and move trivia games 
and Jackbox, kind of all the same thing through the use of the Outsmarted app. Yeah, I think there's a lot more to delve into this on this one, and I'm looking to exper- looking forward to experimenting with it so we can learn what it can and can't do, particularly with remote play. Yeah, highlights include um, two ways to play. So the first is collect six pieces of pie. Oh, sorry, sorry. Collect six rings in all the six different colors and different categories. Then enter an endgame bonus round, which I have not played that way. We have not played a full six rings to know what the bonus round is. Or play to points. And the way the points works is the first question you answer is worth 100 points. And if you start chaining them, you get more points. So second question you get right in a row is worth two. Third question in a row gets three and so on. Um, with the 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 pie, I, I got to stop saying pie. The, the circle squares, the ring, that's it. The ring squares being worth 500. So there is still a reason to answer those harder ring squares when playing for points. Um, that was kind of nice. So it's like literally you can play the old fashioned way or just play for points, whoever's best at trivia. Um, some of the things I really like that, that this is the one factor that I think is going to really make this game is player profiles. You can set ages. Now there's only three, there's kids, teen or adult. But just by doing that, the player acting will get appropriate questions. So that's fantastic. Like a way that I can play a trivia game with Genevieve at the table. That's awesome. It lets players of all ages play together. The other thing that to me blows away Trivia Pursuit is you always play six categories, but you get to pick them. So you can mix up your categories every game. So it's not all you like here for me, I get to avoid the sports questions completely. (laughs) I don't have to use the sports category. So I love that. And then there's the fact that the questions are up to date and constantly being added to and updated, including for those of you who really care, there is a current events category that is updated daily. So like, that's just really neat to have in a trivia game. The concept of the game is admittedly nothing groundbreaking, but yep. it's the remote aspects and, and interactive, interactive aspects, which really make this game have a lot of potential. Yeah. Now, the other thing I did like is when you're setting up a game, you can play to a time limit regardless of what mode you were in. So that was nice. We played a half hour game and then we played an hour game, just trot out. And then of course, Sean's mentioned a few times, the ability to play remotely seems really cool. Supposedly you'll be able to play remotely with some or all players, but we haven't really explored this. We've only done local. Now, what we did find is that once we played the second time, we found that the game went better if everyone had a piece of tech and everyone just played off the app. That way everyone's looking at their own screens rather than sharing a screen. And even when we shared a screen, I'm like, I'm, they t- they give you a stand, put like a tablet on or your phone. I'm not sure like how you're supposed to interact with that. Is like the player who's going supposed to read it from across the table because it doesn't read it out. It's not like Jackbox where they read you the questions. Um, but there is sometimes video and there's sometimes like a graphic, like where is this place is one of the categories and it shows you a famous building and you have to vote. Um, and then it also has the, um, what do you call it? Millionaire thing where you have helps you can call in and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But like, if you're only using one device, like does Sean yell out his answer and I tap it? What if I tap the wrong thing? So even when we only had one device on the table, we just ended up passing it around, which was really boring for the other players because they couldn't see what was happening. Whereas if everyone's on the app, you can see the screen. So you see what questions the other players are getting. So we found it best to play with apps. Yeah, so not necessarily the most social of games when uh, everyone is staring at a screen. Though you'd almost think you just do that, but then there's a board. So the, the one thing I'm really curious about with the, the, the remote play is if Sean joined in our game, how would he know where his piece is? Because it is Trivia Pursuit and that roll the die move, color of the square you're on determines what question you answer. So I, I got to say I'm impressed. Now, there are a couple issues. There's, there's some things that, that I don't love, um, but we're going to have to dive deeper before I'm ready for final thoughts. Uh, again, though, if you are a huge like if Deanna grew up playing Trivia Pursuit with her with her family and loved it, she's like, oh, this is something I used to do with my mom and I'm sharing it with my kids. This just feels right. Just pick it up like it, it's it's not overly expensive. It's almost constantly on sale. Uh, we'll be sure to include a link in the show notes. I think we we may even have affiliate links for them. So it would be appreciated. Used our link. Um, So that one looks really cool. Uh, next up, learning game of Trick Draw with Deanna. This was after the kids went to bed. Um. We kind of talked about this one in the Ask the Bellhop segment, so I'm not going to repeat exactly how you play, but it's the whole, you know, draw a card, play a card, you want 10 points, the card abilities flip things and stuff. And I guess I really like this. And this has that whole tug of war is not really the right term, but like back and forth of of I'm starting to win and then I flip some of your cards and 
and all about the card interactions and a surprisingly engaging game. Uh, it was a hit with two of us. I actually thought when I got the game that it was going to be best at two. But I've got to say, after playing it at our public play event, I think it was better with more than two. And this is one Sean also got to try. So I'm just kind of lumping all our plays together. We played this back at my place after the public play event. What do you think of Trick Draw? Yeah, I was shocked. Um, I don't think any of us had high expectations for this, you know, when it was sort of pitched at us. Um, we, we had some confusion about this. We thought it was a trick taking game because it's in the name. Uh, but it's really solid with mm -hmm. good production quality and it's super quick and easy to learn how to play. Yeah. Um, I think looking at this on this a game on the shelf, it would be really easy to shrug off and ignore. Yeah, it is a great fast playing game. Uh, and I'm wondering with an initial offering like this, they've got this concept of Salundria, which is mm -hmm. the world of uh, uh, that this game takes place in that apparently they're looking to expand on. It, it could be something to watch out for if other games continue to be of this quality. Now, at the bar, I hosted and played a six-player game of no context. Now, this was the game that really showed off to me how different people make connections and how the advantage of knowing someone affected the game. And again, I, the thing that blows me away is just how different sitting down with this group of players and, and basing my bets on playing with my family and being so wrong. Yeah, it, it's fun to watch people playing. It, it's got a real public play appeal. So if you are someone who runs that kind of uh, that kind of event, this is another reason that this might be a choice for you. Uh, next up, I finally sat down with longtime fan of the show tech and taught him and his girls drop it. Uh, this is one he's been waiting to play. He, I've now taught him go cuckoo and drop it. So I, I don't know if we're we're on at the end of the, the games we must play with tech or not. Uh, you'll have to let me know, Kevin, if, there, if there's something else to bring next time. Uh, it was as expected a big hit. And now I also ended up showing off this game to a group that showed up later in the night who ended up being the moderators of the Windsor D and D discord. So it was awesome that they showed up to even just check out the event. They'd never been to one of our board game events. And we're like, we're doing something later at night, but we're going to stop by and play some games. And I got to say, drop it was a huge hit. And I love showing that to people whose idea of board games, you know, maybe get to Catan level and not much further. And they're just like, Whoa, games can do this. So that was awesome. Yeah, this game has been a hit every single public event. Drop It is yeah. just an all-ages success at public play events. Yeah, I, I can't think of... I, there'll be a time sometime in the future where I stop bringing this to every public play event, but that time is not now. <laughs> now, that same group of um, mainly D&D &D players, uh, sh I showed Gokuku. Um, technically, Gokuku was before Drop It, but whatever. Um, this is another great experience. We played two rounds, um, and then they actually played a game on their own. This was the game I mentioned earlier in the show where they needed a break. They're like, I've never played a board game that's this intense or that makes me sweat. What is this? Why do I care so much about these little legs? So that was a lot of fun. Um, the last game I played with them, though, was Monstrosity, because I just I was sitting I'm like, wait, you're from a D&D &D group. I don't know who's a DM, who's a player, but anyone who's played D&D &D has either heard or had to describe a monster. So I'm like, here, I'm going to sell it to you as the D&D &D version of there's a monster that just raided the village. You're the only witness and you're having to describe to the, the adventuring party who to go out and hunt. Right. So I, I kind of put the spin on the description and, and I got to say that, yeah, it, it went over really well. Now, my daughter Gwen joined for this one as well. Um, this is the first group I've ever played the game with that just wanted to keep going. Often once around the table, people are like, OK, like we can play something else. The actual rules are twice around the table, so some groups will do two. Well, we played two, and they were like, okay, can we play again? Can we, can we get going? And I'm like, unfortunately, at that point, it was past 10 o'clock, and our official event time was done, and I had, uh, Gwen is not allowed to stay in the bar once they stop serving food, so we had to go. So I felt bad for leaving them hanging, but that group was definitely like, oh, I want to play more. Yeah, now Monstrosity isn't really for me, but it's great to see that it stands out so much for some people. It's another one that can, pardon the pun, draw a crowd around mm -hmm. those playing it. While well, you were playing that, Dee and I got into the game of Castellans of Valeria with Brenda and Matt, neither of whom had played it before. Uh, it was my first time teaching it, and thankfully I had Dee there to help as well. Uh, it did go well. I find that game is actually pretty easy to teach once you're familiar with it. Um, 
but it's a game where as we've said there is a lot of information and your mm -hmm. first game is going to be a learning one yet still even though with that uh the scores were tight enough with no real nice. runaway winner despite deep playing and winning uh, and then we we then played a game of Point Salad to wrap up the night as uh, Castellan's is a longer game, as yeah. we mentioned earlier during the ask. Yeah, you played with four? Oh, uh, yeah, four player. Four, yeah. So not quite as long as it could be, but yeah. yes. I should have got a good picture of the board when it was done, just how full it gets. That's one thing I love about that game is the way it looks at the end. And man, um, Ian, the representative from the CG realm, was <laughs> blown away he by that just game. just kept coming over and looking I, I couldn't i have never seen him more excited by game components than he was with castellans of valeria he called me over and i'm like it's my game Ian. i know what it looks <laughs> like but have you seen this and i'm like yeah it's my game <laughs> well it's not now i passed it on to another reviewer but yes um then same night again we're, we're playing with the timeline we're getting timey-wimey here but um sean gwen and i got together and played a couple games after the game night uh, Trick Draw, which I already talked about, but then we broke out a brand new DOS game, which is from ELO. It's Ishtar Gardens of Babylon, which I actually first saw at the last um, Origins I was at and was really tempted to try out a review copy, but I had enough stuff to bring home, so I didn't grab it. And I, you can't help but make the movie reference, which I had to do at the time. They didn't appreciate that. <laughs> but this first play was a little rough. Now, the big problem is my own fault. I waited too long between reading the rules and teaching the game and basically had to reread them at the table, which is never a good idea. And we say not to do it, but you know what? Sometimes everyone's there and they're willing to learn. When, whenever I get players together who are willing to learn something new, it's always good to get something new to the table as far as I'm concerned. So the start of the game was super rough. And even by the end, we were still discovering things we didn't catch. And there was one particular move that ended up pretty much ruining the first play as far as an extreme play and we don't even know when it happened it was one of those we're like oh wait that can't happen yeah, a star was certainly interesting make sure that you share the player board reference around at the start of the game yes the strange iconography like trading meeple with cactuses doesn't <laughs> make any sense so read through the skill options in advance before yeah. you start and you will play very differently Yes. Well, just watch out for connecting things that can't connect. And the other thing is there's a bit of a tech tree in this game. Don't just read the bottom level and go, I'll figure that out later because man, did that answer some questions that came up? Yeah. Like, yeah. why are we placing trees where? Go through, yeah, go through that whole reference sheet. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this was a hundred percent a learning game. So you know what? I I I can't say anything about the game. I I Really, like with such a learning game with so many mistakes and so many discoveries in the middle of play due to trying to get it to the table a little quicker than I probably should have. All I will say is it looks great. Um, It seems to be quite interesting. And I've got to say, like for an abstract strategy game, it does look pretty solid. But like it's going to take another play where we actually know what we're doing and we're not connecting fountains. We shouldn't. Yeah, no, I, I'm really interested in this one. I think this played really well, despite, you know, we caught our mistakes. We know yes. what we did wrong. Uh, and, and knowing that, I'm able to look at it and think, no, that actually looks like a pretty good game. Yeah, it looks solid. Well, that's it for what we've been playing. Now let's have a look at what we have coming up next. Uh, so with all the gaming we've been getting in, we are building up a bit of a backlog of reviews to be done, which is a good thing, which is way better than falling behind on reviews. So in the coming weeks, expect to see reviews of Trick Draw. At this point, I think we played enough. We could probably review it now. We just didn't have room. Uh, Siege of Valeria, which is a solo Valeria game both Sean and I have played. I still want to kind of pressure Deanna to try it to see what she thinks. Um, Outsmarted, which we talked about. And again, if you're a Trivial Pursuit fan, go for it. Like, we dig Trivial Pursuit. Not, not like, eh, like Trivial But you're like, no, no, Trivial Pursuit's a good family game night. Just go buy it. Um, and there's other things. Now, the other thing I do have to do is Alliterati. I want to try that out. That is a co-op real-time word game, but it's ages seven plus. So it's not like a big Scrabble kind of game. So I'm looking forward to that one. And what I really need to do because of this, this I do feel like I'm falling a bit behind on is I'm going to have to build one of the 3D puzzles I have. So I have the orbital box from Escape Welt, and then I have something from a company called Intrism. So the Intrism Mini, which is a build your own, what do you even call those? Perplexus is the, the brand. Like if I'm going to use the Kleenex term, <laughs> it would be Perplexus, but it's these puzzles with marbles in them. You try to get the marble out. 
So those I, I may live stream. I'm thinking they, they are probably worth live streaming. I just don't know if I want to live stream them, but I think they'll be useful. And then Sean can do a nice little time condensed kind of like our, our box insert builds. I'm going to be bringing home the full DC multiverse this weekend uh, and just let the kids decide uh, what we want to play out of it. Uh, and possibly nothing. It could be, we could end up playing out something yeah. completely differently, but uh, yeah, the whole, the whole box is going to come home now. It's all been repackaged up into one singular box. Mo got to, got to heft it the other day. It's, yes. uh, it's dense. <laughs> yes, it is. There you I think it's heavier than Gloomhaven. It's pretty close with the box insert. Well, this show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle and Owen Thomas, looking forward to hearing your thoughts on Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. Sean P. Kelly, thanks, Sean. Derek Hisson, thanks, Derek. And Andrew Dacey, thank you, Andrew. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Help keep the lights on and keep us talking by tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. That's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live, and be sure to stick around for the penthouse suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.